This is where we left off with part two, describing three ways that microorganisms damage the host. Um, enzymes and toxins being the two direct ways, and then we had indirect damage due to an overreactive host response. Okay. Now, eventually, microorganisms will settle in a specific region and cause damage at that site, and there are lots of ways this can happen. Um, in some instances, host tissues are weakened simply as a result of the multiplication of the pathogen. They will actually leach nutrients from that particular area. Um, like we saw with some of the helmets, we can see pathogens obstruct tubular structures, um, creating things like masses of helmets or blood clots in particular areas. Uh, we can see necrosis, uh, which is accumulated tissue. We can see necrosis, which is accumulated damage leading to tissue death. And then when we get to the viruses, we're actually going to talk about how viruses destroy cells outright. Now, terminology in here that you need to be familiar with, um, a localized ref infection remains confined to a specific area. While systemic infections are the opposite, they have a tendency to spread. Uh, anything that is systemic is usually body-wide. Think anything that hits the blood or other uh, liquids or tissues that flow throughout the body. Uh, focal infections begin as localized infections and then uh, turn into systemic infections. Uh, the area from which they spread is often termed the foci, F-O-C-I. We see mixed infections, also known as polymicrobial infections, that are caused by more than one type of microorganism. Okay. Primary infections, which you are somewhat familiar with. Um, a primary infection is what we consider an initial infection. It's very rarely a term that is used unless you are also dealing with a secondary infection, uh, which is often a result or sort of something you get because of the primary infection. Okay. Uh, we see acute infections. Uh, this is a description of length of infection. Uh, usually we see rapid onset and rapid recovery in an acute infection. Okay. This is a grand scheme of things. And a chronic infection uh, that progresses and persists over extended periods of time. This could be months, years, or possibly even the duration of someone's life. Now, all this is terminology. You should be familiar with it and be able to actually use this to describe uh, examples that are given to you. Now, when we see warning signs of disease, they are very often described as signs or symptoms. Okay? The big difference here is that a sign can be noted by an observer. You can measure it. You can see it. Um, a symptom would be subjective, uh, specifically sensed by the patient or sufferer, and a syndrome is actually a combination of typical signs and symptoms that lead to a clear uh, sort of definition of a disease. Examples here, symptoms, uh, those that you could absolutely not measure, chills, pain, soreness, uh, people just saying they don't feel good, aching ears, stomach issues, these are the ones that you just have to take in an individual's word for. Signs will include things like edema, uh, an accumulation of fluids, granulomas or abscesses, which are usually walled off inflammatory cells. We see these uh, very commonly when we're dealing with things like tuberculosis. Uh, lymphadenitis or swollen lymph nodes. We can see leukocytosis, uh, where we see an increase in white blood cells. Uh, this is pretty common response uh, to infection. Uh, or, in some instances, leukopenia, where we see a decrease in white blood cells, and this is not due to lack of infection. Usually, leukopenia is associated with some form of infection where the organism is actually destroying white blood cells. Uh, septicemia, where we find microorganisms multiplying within the blood and present in relatively large numbers. Um, or bacteremia or viremia, uh, bacteria and viruses respectively, present in the blood but not necessarily multiplying. Okay. Now, it is possible for individuals to have infections that go unnoticed. Okay where there are no signs and no clear symptoms. Uh, the microorganism is present, but not necessarily causing a noticeable infection. Okay. 
And these instances, uh, hosts very often become carriers of disease because they do not seek medical attention, as most of us don't when we don't feel particularly bad. Okay? If you feel all right, most of us stay home instead of going to the doctor. Uh, these are also known as asymptomatic, subclinical, or inapparent infections. All terms used to describe asymptomatic or unnoticed infections, those without signs or symptoms. So, step five in those five requirements, uh, vacating the host. So we're seeing portals of exit here, and one thing you will notice is that it's very common for portals of exit to look a lot like portals of entry, okay? Uh, so, secretions, excretions, discharges, sloughed off tissue, coughing, sneezing, urinating, fecal matter, uh, anything that leaves the body is more than likely going to contain high numbers of pathogens and even non-pathogenic microorganisms. Okay. Uh, very common portals of exit are often associated with the specific portal of entry. We see things uh, in the GI tract. Uh, the fecal oral route is very common. Uh, both entry and exits uh, as far as gastrointestinal tract goes. Things that are coughed and acquired through coughing or sneezing are very often coughed or sneezed onto other people to help transmit them. Um, insect bites and other vectors that gain access by via the parenteral route okay, um, will often have organisms shed the same way. They get picked up and moved because another insect comes in and picks them up. Now, <clears throat> it is possible for microorganisms to persist even after the infection seems to have gone away. Uh, recovery of the host does not always mean the organism is gone. It is very, it, not very common, but it's not unheard of for organisms to lie dormant in something we call latency. Okay. Uh, viral latency is a little bit more common than bacterial latency. Uh, herpes viruses, herpes simplex, herpes zoster, hepatitis B, um, the HIV, AIDS virus, and Epstein-Barr have all been found to lie dormant for extended periods of time. Probably the best example we have of this, and we'll get more into it when we talk about the viruses, is chickenpox. Okay? Uh, specifically, that is herpes uh, <clears throat> zoster virus, okay? viracella zoster. That particular virus uh, will lie dormant for extended periods of time, decades. Okay. Uh, we see syphilis and typhoid and sometimes things like tuberculosis lie dormant when it comes to bacteria. Um, we see malarial latency when it comes to protozoa. Okay. It's also possible to see long-term damage from exposure to microorganisms. This is something we term sequelae. Okay. Uh, yes, it does sound a lot like a sequel. That's how I usually think about it, like a sequel to the disease itself. The unfortunate part is, even though you are no longer infected, uh, the sequelae remain. Examples of this will include things like deafness with meningitis, uh, possible to have rheumatic heart disease if strep throat progresses to rheumatic fever. Uh, Lyme disease and arthritis are pretty much consistently found together. Okay. Um, and in about 5% of all polio myelitis cases, we see uh, par paralysis, okay? Uh, that's not common with polio. Like I said, it's only about 5% of polio cases, but paralysis is nonetheless a sequela, okay? So what happens to your body when you get sick? Uh, what we're looking for are stages of infections, uh, sort of periods of sickness, okay? Now, after you come in contact with a microorganism, and specifically you're going to have to come in contact with the appropriate infectious dose, uh, we see people transition to what we consider an incubation period. Okay. Uh, during that incubation period, we see no signs and symptoms of disease. Uh, here, basically what's happening is that these organisms are increasing in numbers. Okay. So we're increasing numbers. Okay. And then eventually you enter into what's considered a prodromal phase. Now, 
in the prodromal phase. This is usually a relatively short period of time. Uh, people have general mild symptoms. Uh, lots of times these are this is that moment when you know you don't feel well and you're starting to get sick, uh, but you don't have any specific signs and symptoms. It's that day of blah, okay, uh, sort of general unwellness. Okay. Uh, eventually, people enter into an invasive phase where you see typical signs and symptoms of disease. Okay. Now, these signs and symptoms increase and progress okay, until eventually they reach a point. Now, your book calls it the height of infection, but we also term this the acme. Okay. And at this point, the infection has sort of topped itself off. It will not get any worse than this. This is as bad as things are going to be. So at this point, we will either persist at this level of sickness. Okay? Uh, in some instances, uh, infections that are bad enough, we see people that make it to this point actually succumb to their illness. Okay? Or, which is the hope for all of us, eventually we move into a decline phase. Okay? Now, in this decline phase, I'm going to move convalescence period over here. I'm not a particularly huge fan of how this is done. Uh, but in the decline phase, we see symptoms begin to subside. There are one of two reasons to enter into a decline phase. One, either your host defenses kicked in and your immune system started working for you, or you got smart and went to the doctor and got an antimicrobial to help you overcome the infection. Either one leads to the same result, okay? a decline in overall signs and symptoms, and then eventual, oh, I'm sorry, and then eventual move towards a wellness and a convalescence period, I prefer this diagram, uh, where tissues are repaired and healing begins to take place. At this point in time, uh, it's not necessarily the case that you can not spread the disease. There are several diseases that people can still spread as what we term convalescent carriers. Uh, they're getting better and are no longer sick but are still able to spread the disease. Uh, <clears throat> at this point in time, you're just making it back to a place where you can regain strength. Okay. So, a little bit more terminology. Uh, we're sort of moving into the epidemiology portion of this. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about transmission and picking up microorganisms. Uh, so first terms I'm going to start with are reservoir and transmitter. Okay? Now a reservoir is a habitat in which the pathogen resides. Okay? This is where your organism, the pathogen itself, lives normally. It's not uncommon for it to be a human, but it can also be what we consider a non-living reservoir, soil, water. Okay. Uh, to go along with this, there are also what we term transmitters, okay, an individual or an object from which the infection is acquired. It is possible for the same object to be a reservoir and a transmitter, but oftentimes okay, we see reservoirs and transmitters being different things. And when it comes to syphilis that is sexually transmitted, uh, the reservoir and transmitter are the same. Okay? Uh, it will be naturally found in humans, so the normal habitat is a human, and it's transmitted via a human. Okay? But in hepatitis A, the reservoir is a human, with the normal transmitter actually being food. This is what we consider a food-borne illness. Okay? Uh, lots of times for the non-living reservoirs, you'll hear things like air, born, okay, or water, born illness. Okay. It's very, very common. Now, very often we see reservoirs being humans. Okay. Uh, Oftentimes we refer to these as carriers, and human reservoirs come in one of two varieties. Uh, sick people that are obvious reservoirs, and carriers who usually inconspicuously shelter uh, a pathogen and spread it to others uh, unknowingly. Okay? Uh, we see 
chronic carriers that have diseases for extended periods and never realize it, uh, convalescent carriers who, like we were talking about earlier, um, are actually getting over the disease and they don't realize it, uh, asymptomatic carriers that never have symptoms, uh, and chances are they will never get sick. Okay? Uh, we see incubatory carriers who are still in that incubation phase and actually are spreading the disease not knowing that they will soon get sick. We also see animals as reservoirs and sources of disease, most commonly uh, arthropods, again insects, fleas, flies, ticks, mosquitoes. Okay. Uh, these get divided into two categories of vector, okay, what we term a biological vector, and we've used the term vector before. Um, a biological vector where the organism is actually part of the vector's life cycle. Uh, the easiest way to remember this is that biolog biological vectors have the pathogen inside of the vector. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, a mechanical vector actually carries the microorganism uh, pretty much accidentally on its body parts. Uh, here the pathogen will be outside of the organism. Uh, think in terms of a fly landing on fecal matter um, outside and then landing on your sandwich at a park. It didn't actually have the organisms, the bacteria inside of the fly. Uh, the bacteria came from the fly picking up bacteria on its feet and then landing somewhere else to spread the organism. Okay. Uh, any vector that passes things by biting is a biological vector. It's kind of sort of an easier way to remember it. Okay. If it bites and passes it through okay, um, from its body to yours via the bite, biological vector. We also see larger animals spread infections. Uh, these are termed zoonoses, or what we call a zoonotic infection. Zoonotic, okay. Um, for example, rabies found in mammals. Um, we see salmonella in lizards and young chicks, Easter chicks, uh, and even small turtles. Um, birds carry something called cytococcosis. Okay. Um, cytokosis is rarely passed from birds to humans, but we do see it. Um, so a zoonotic disease or zoonoses, an infection spread okay, uh, to humans from an animal. Okay. Now, we also see those non-living reservoirs that we talked about. Again, soil, water, food, I okay, fall into these categories. Uh, food is probably, or I'm sorry, water is probably the most common because everyone is in need of water. There is no way to survive without it. So water is probably the most commonly seen non-living reservoir to actually spread disease. Okay. Uh, we do also name what we consider inanimate objects okay, uh, as so, uh, as vectors or reservoirs of infection, uh, <clears throat> we term these fomites. Get used to this term. Uh, think uh, somebody blowing their nose in Kleenex and you cleaning the Kleenex up. The Kleenex is a fomite. Uh, touching the doorknob after someone has spread germs to it, fomite. Uh, placing someone else's pencil in your mouth while you are working, that pencil becomes a fomite because it is responsible for spreading microorganisms. Now, <clears throat> a little bit more terminology to go along here. Um, a communicable versus a contagious disease. Uh, communicable diseases have an infected host actually transmit the infectious agent to another host. In other words, these are passed from host to host. Very often the term infectious is used synonymously with the term communicable, so they're pretty much interchangeable. Uh, however, the term contagious is not the same thing as the term communicable. Okay? 
A contagious disease is communicable, but it is considered highly communicable. In other words, it is easy to acquire. Um, I always tell people think about proximity. If you can get it from sitting next to someone or being close to them, it is contagious. Right? Meanwhile, it is only communicable if you actually have to do something like cut yourself and uh, touch their open wound as well or exchange any type of bodily fluid. That disease is communicable Okay. while one where proximity to one another would be a danger is contagious. Okay. So influenza and measles, highly contagious, okay. while leprosy is only weakly communicable. Okay. Uh, we know that it has something to do with contact, but even most people that come in contact with individuals that have leprosy do not develop leprosy. Okay. You can be in a room hours after someone with the, the measles has left that room and still contract measles. It's a little less talked about, but there are also sets of non-communicable infectious diseases that do not uh, arise through transmission of infectious agents from host to host. In other words, you don't get it from another person. Okay? Uh, we see opportunistic infections where individuals are invaded by their own microflora. Um, remember those endogenous infections that we talked about. That's obviously not a communicable disease. You're moving your personal flora from one place to another with an adverse uh, effect. Or an individual that has accidental contact with a microorganism that exists in a non-living reservoir. Okay. Uh, think tetanus. Okay. Tetanus is not communicable. You're not going to give it to someone else. Uh, most of the time, people get tetanus through a puncture wound. Yes, in your heads, I realize that you're thinking stepping on a rusty nail. Uh, here's a hint. The nail does not have to be rusty, nor does it have to be a nail. Okay. Tetanus is particularly fond of puncture wounds that make their way deep into tissues away from free unbound oxygen. Now, we also see uh, different types of transmission patterns when it comes to communicable diseases. Uh, horizontal transfer, uh, where we see the spread from one member of society to another, and vertical transmission from parent to offspring. Vertical transmission um, is what we're seeing right now with Zika virus uh, that's been in the news very recently. Uh, where the virus is actually being transmitted to the fetus and causing things like microcephaly, or they're suspecting that it causes microcephaly. Uh, mostly what we see is horizontal transmission, things like direct contact, okay, physical uh, contact between individuals, touching, kissing, even shaking hands. Um, we can see the parenteral route being an issue here. Okay. When we cut individuals, it's still considered direct contact. Uh, droplet transmission falls into this uh, where basically uh, droplets are sneezed, coughed, or sometimes even spoken onto another individual. Uh, fomites and indirect transmission. Okay. I have some type of vehicle in here somewhere, air, water, soil, or food. So airborne, waterborne, soilborne, or foodborne transmissions. Um, special category that gets mentioned, the fecal oral route. Okay. Fecal carrier uh, actually usually ends up handling food, so we end up with fecal matter on food and having someone unwillingly, unknowingly ingest it. Okay, uh, and then another uh, section on vector transmission. So Table 11A actually sums up a lot of the information that we just went through. Now. The last little bit I want to talk about is mainly epidemiology, and it's going to include nosocomial infections. Uh, these are what we term hospital-acquired infections or healthcare facility-acquired infections. And again, do not think that you need to memorize these numbers. Okay, uh, <clears throat> these are found in anywhere from 0.1 to 20 percent of all admitted patients, with an average being about 5 percent. In other words, about one in 20 uh, admitted individuals into the hospital will end up with a hospital-acquired infection. Okay. 
uh, somewhere between two and four million cases per year, equating to about 90,000 deaths. Uh, it's eight million additional days of hospitalization and an increased cost of somewhere between five and ten billion dollars. Okay. The most common example of this that we see being urinary tract infections accounting for somewhere around 40 percent of all nosocomial or hospital acquired infections. Uh, the main reason for this, anybody want to guess? You said catheters, you're right. People being cast. Okay. Now, the reason I bring this up and the reason it's a big issue is because evidence suggests that about a third of nosocomial infections could have actually been avoided if people had been consistently and rigorously utilizing appropriate infection control mechanisms. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Prior to the AIDS epidemic, we actually saw control guidelines be disease specific. Okay. Uh, now we do uh, all out bloodborne pathogens. Okay. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention actually laid down much more strict guidelines uh, because we see the potential for undiagnosed HIV positive patients. Okay. Uh, it's mainly designed to protect patients, uh, but <clears throat> do not be fooled. Uh, the design there also protects healthcare workers and the public okay? because what we've enlisted are what we consider a set of universal precautions. Basically working under the assumption that all patients could harbor potentially infectious agents and should all be treated with the same degree of care. You have no idea just by looking at someone what they might or might not have. It is foolish to think that just because someone looks healthy that they are healthy. Now, one of the gentlemen we really have to thank for this is a man by the name of Robert Koch. Okay? And Koch was sort of the father of what we consider modern microbiology. And he came up with a way to link uh, the etiologic or causative agent of an infection to its disease. And that link is a four-step uh, set of proofs okay, that we call Koch's postulates. Okay. The thought here is that what we're going to see is a specific microorganism will be found in all cases of disease, but not in healthy animals. In other words, individuals that have strep throat will all have strep bacteria. Individuals that do not have strep throat will not have strep bacteria in their throats. Simple enough. We must be able to isolate the organism and grow it in pure culture in the lab from a diseased animal. We should be able to isolate the strep from an individual's throat and grow it by itself. Okay. If uh, we introduce that culture into a healthy organism, that <clears throat> the exact same disease should occur. In other words, if we put that strep bacteria into another person, uh, they should get strep and not the flu. That would be ridiculous. Uh, some microorganisms must be grown in pure culture, again, from the infected animal. So we should be able to take the newly infected animal that has now been sickened with the same disease, pull out the microorganism, and grow the exact same microorganism. It should not be something different. Okay? So all of these together are Koch's way of proving that a specific organism causes a specific disease. We take that for granted now, knowing that strep bacteria within your throat is going to cause strep throat. Uh, that having influenza virus is going to be what causes influenza. But this is early 1900s. Koch was ahead of our time. Now, there are some exceptions to this in situations in which Koch's postulates do not apply. Okay? Uh, we have issues growing some infectious agents uh, in the lab. Not everything will grow outside of a cell. Okay? So if we can't grow it in the lab, we can never grow it in pure culture. Some organisms are limited to specific types of animals. If you have to grow it in a human to get it to grow, or the infection will only occur in a human, then you would have to infect human after human. This is unethical. Okay. Uh, we also see polymicrobial diseases. 
Uh, if you remember, polymicrobial means being caused by more than one organism. It is impossible to grow a polymicrobial disease in pure culture. The terms exclude one another automatically. Polymicrobial, multiple organisms, and pure culture means we're dealing with one thing. There is no way to interlace the two. So, the last bit of this, we're going to talk about epidemiology. Uh, definition here, the study of frequency and distribution of disease and other health-related factors in defined populations. Okay. Uh, epidemiologists at the CDC and the World Health Organization uh, come together and involve many, many disciplines in their research. This will include anatomists, physiologists, microbiologists, statisticians, sociologists, um, doctors, immunologists, psychologists, ecologists. Okay? Uh, there will be individuals from all walks of life. Okay? They also consider every form of disease, not just those that are inherited, uh, heart disease, I'm sorry, and not just those that are infectious, um, also those that are inherited, heart disease, drug addiction, mental illness, uh, to be very honest, the CDC has information on things like how much fast food we eat. One way we're keeping track of this is with a list of reportable or what we call nationally notifiable diseases. Uh, it's basically a list that all doctors are provided with saying that uh, the Centers for Disease Control would like information on how many cases of each individual disease we see. Okay? So these are reported. Uh, to usually local health departments that then report them to the CDC or report them to the state and the state reports them to the national level. Okay. Uh, to be honest, we work very closely with the World Health Organization so a lot of our information is then passed on to the international level. Okay. So, uh, epidemiological terms you should know. Okay. Um, prevalence, incidence, and mortality rate. Uh, the prevalence of a disease, the number of existing cases with respect to the entire population. Okay? Uh, so in other words, number of cases in the U.S. in 2013. Okay? Uh, an incident rate uh, sounds very similar, but this one actually measures new cases. So the number of new cases of disease in the U.S. in 2013. Uh, together these numbers give us a decent projection of who is getting sick, who is surviving being sick, and how we're doing trend-wise on maintaining and or preventing illness. Okay. Mortality rates actually measure numbers of deaths within certain periods of time. Uh, <clears throat> and those are often linked to specific illnesses. If we see sharp increases in mortality rates, we know that something is specifically going on with that disease itself. Okay. Right. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, I have the these numbers in here again. Prevalence, incidence, and mortality rates. Okay. Uh, if you are a visual person, uh, some of the data in here actually gives us a decent amount of... Uh, incidence rates and mortality rates and you can see actually trends in malaria incidents down here at the bottom. We also see what are considered common source outbreaks or common source epidemics and propagated epidemics. Uh, in a common source outbreak everyone acquires the disease from a common source. Um, I think if we all went to the same fast food restaurant I bought everyone tacos and everyone called me later saying that they had food poisoning it would be a common source outbreak. We all got it from the same place. Um, the least decent part of that would be that we all tend to get sick at the same time and get well at the same time. There usually aren't any stragglers in the group. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> to go along with this, we also have what are termed propagated epidemics. And in a propagated epidemic, uh, we see the disease passed from person to person. Here, everyone does not get sick at the same time. Uh, disease has a tendency to be sustained over time, and by the time individuals are sick here, these individuals are getting well again. Okay? 
um, but the pass is usually in lower numbers than the common source outbreak um, when it comes to an individual block of time, but this can last much longer and eventually encompass much higher numbers. Uh, propagated epidemics think the flu or a cold. It's going to be passed and passed and passed repeatedly. So uh, the last of this little bit of terminology, uh, mainly having to do with the spread of disease, uh, the first patient that usually begins an outbreak and sort of brings the disease to the forefront is what's known as an index case. Okay? Lots of times you'll hear this person referred to as patient zero. Uh, an endemic disease remains steady over an extended period of time. And actually, I'm going to move into the next slide. Uh, you guys have this information in your notes. So an endemic disease, you can see steady numbers in a consistent area. If this was maintained over months or even years, this disease would be endemic in this particular area. Okay? Now epidemic occurrences, we see higher than normal numbers. It doesn't have to be huge high numbers, okay? but higher than normal numbers uh, within a specific area usually we consider it enough to constitute a public health threat. So if this was normal, this would be much more than we're used to. And then look over here. Okay? We were missing these in the endemic case. Sudden disease creeping up here in higher numbers. This is a public health problem. That would be an epidemic. Okay? Sporadic occurrences usually look like a very randomized outbreak. They usually have pretty low numbers, but don't seem to have much pattern to them when they occur. Okay? And pandemic diseases spread from continent to continent. Okay? Uh, think HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, those top three that we were talking about in chapter one. Okay? Uh, so this is it for chapter 11. Uh, study for the test. Be ready for that. It's coming. Don't forget to ask questions on D2L if you have them.